So uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, once again, thanks for inviting us to be here today, trying to uh, uh, explain to you why we believe glass is sustainable, can be even more sustainable to the future. Um, I'm going to try to gain some time in, uh, in because we're a little bit delayed. But I'll try to pass three messages. One is what has glass industry has been doing actually in the last uh, decades. We cannot talk in the last years about sustainability. Then uh, we'll review a couple of concepts. Why is glass still one of the most sustainable materials? And finally, I think we need to address this audience as we signed the Oporto Protocol last year. And we're already moving on the commitments that we decided to have with the planet for the years to come. Um, I said decades. Uh, there's two reasons why the glass industry thinks about sustainability for a long time. One, because it uses a lot of energy. And of course, that energy has a cost. And therefore, it makes all sense that we start saving that cost for a long time already. It hits your bottom line of your business, so it makes sense. The second, has to do more with, there's so many cool things about glass. It has such great properties. It enhances the value of your product and other products. So why not to continue and search and try to create the perfect material for the product you have to sell, but also for the planet we live in. So I think these two reasons have set the industry a long time ago to be worried about this. So we're going to see a couple of numbers that are quite breathtaking when you think about it, the job that has been done in the last years. Uh, because of technology investments today, we are able to put out 7 million tons of CO2 every year that we're not emitting. And that is more or less the same as taking 4 million cars a year out of the streets. It's a very big number. This is just European Union. Okay. The energy reduction in the last 40 years has been 80%, which of course translates immediately on the reduction of CO2 emissions on the order of a 70% as well. This is amazing because it's already because of you that these numbers are up here. 138 million tons of glass have not gone to landfill. That means that, of course, we're not extracting from Earth sand, soda ash, and other materials that were used to make glass. But that is only because in the European Union, only in the last 15 years, the increase of recycling has been amazing. And that's up to you as citizens, uh, more than wine stakeholders in this point. But it's one of the ways that we have to actually emit less CO2 is if we use more recycled glass in our furnaces. You know that there's a, a big ocean thing with plastics today. And it's funny to think, well, not funny, no, but I think it's better to think if it was glass that was sent to the ocean, we wouldn't have the problem of contamination that we have today. For a sim very simple reason, because it would just land on the seabed, is a natural product, no migrations whatsoever. So, of course, you don't want to throw the glass to the sea. That's not what we're saying. But it would have been a lot better if we have done it instead of using the plastic packaging. This is a, a very interesting theme because I think there's still a lot of doubts about how light can a glass bottle be. And, uh, and even in, uh, in uh, the two paradigms that I think it still generates, one of them was actually clarified yesterday by the Jackson family. First of all, because we believe the consumer will value less the wine if it is in a lighter bottle. Well, the Jackson family yesterday told us that they did the experiment, they didn't notice anything. So there's a lot of bottles that you have still today in the market that can be lightweighted. The second paradigm that I think is also important is people think by getting lighter, it will be less resistant. Not true. Technology actually today helps you that even going lighter, you have a better control of what you're doing, and therefore, it gets lighter but more resistant. So this is what the industry has done. But uh, how, how sustainable is glass? And sustainability is not only carbon emissions. Of course, we need to tackle that. It's a lot more things. And uh, let's look a little bit at the loop 
that today exists in glass. And remember one thing, glass was the first material that actually was recognized as no garbage. That it was actually start to being collected from the communities and start creating a cycle so that we reuse more than we just throw away. Well, in a very short, uh, these are numbers also for the European Union. Today, 74% of the glass that is put in the market is collected, is recycled. That means, as I said before, no landfill, okay? But it means as well that we use it as a, per, a primary raw material because, as I said before, with one percentage point of more recycled glass you put in the furnace, you reduce your emissions, you reduce the energy that you spend. So why not do it more? And then the amazing thing about glass is that you don't destroy any value. So if you recycle one bottle today, that will mean another bottle 5,000 years from now if you want because it doesn't lose any material value and you can do it often and often and often with no degradation whatsoever. Well, if you ship the bottles to you and you fill them, today you don't need to wash them, so you're saving water as well. So you can be asking why, I mean, what is missing for this cycle to actually close? And we have a carbon neutral packaging, right? It's, we're still not there, but there's only two things actually. Number one, of course, we need to work on technology of our furnaces to be more dependent on electricity from renewable energy sources. At the same time, eventually, and there's some uh, discussion about it, how can you do a hybrid furnace with electricity and something that is not fossil fuel? Well, that will solve it. Of course, I think although efforts are being done, that will take a little bit longer. But meanwhile, you can actually recycle more. So if you actually recycle technically 100%, that will start saving emissions way faster than it is today. So I'm going to change a little bit the way uh, or the presentation that I'm doing here today because I will address you now more as citizens than as wine stakeholders. Of course, both are important, but I think as citizens, the conscience for what you're about to see is probably be, will be elevated. Uh, so basically what we want, we want, them, we want you, us to recycle more, and at the same time, we in BA are optimistic or positivists saying that we believe that the sustainability uh, effort that we do will actually have value to the product that you want to sell. Let's look at how the consumer has been behaving against some certain things for the last 50 to 60 years. You, uh, you know, I don't know if you're a big fan or not, I'm a big fan of Mad Men. It's a great Netflix series about the uh, advertising agency in the 1960s. And uh, these guys, basically, they're all smoking, as you see, and most of the revenue, actually, in that time came from cigarette companies. And there's this geek scientist guy that goes in and in an episode and says, oh, here's you know, a lot of papers saying that this, this thing can kill you. And say, well, it doesn't matter. In five seconds, they trash that and they, you know, expel the geek guy from the room. What I want to say is that it took 60 years since the first study showing the first connection between lung cancer and smoking to be acknowledged by governments and to have the first laws to protect at least passive smokers. In plastics, and amazingly enough, in the 1960s, um, actually before 1960s, BPA, biosphenol A, a component that is used for plastics to get rigidity and also more complex forms, is actually, there's a study in the 60s saying there's very dangerous estrogens going to the food and liquid that it contains. It was not until 2011, 2011, so 51 years, that the FDA and the EFSA forbid it just for baby bottles because they're still out there in some packaging. Let's now talk a little bit of things that today everyone is conscious about. You know, 1997 was when Captain Charles Moore discovered the first garbage patch in the Pacific. Well, the Blue Pan Planet movie that was referenced here uh, yesterday, I think it was uh, 2001, 2002, but the trigger that actually made the plastic things in the oceans really big was actually the YouTube video that was narrated by Jeff Bridges. And what is amazing is that within two years, this became primary agenda for all governments 
of a lot of countries in the world. What I want to say is that, I mean, the power that generations of today have to be informed about general information, scientific facts, and to spread it with conviction, that's what led us, at least in BA, to be optimistic that it will be possible to change ways of living. They will be a lot more powerful in making choices that will affect their families or their planets. And they will do it a lot faster in a much global scale than we believe. Consumers today are ready to take any of these challenges. And this is what we believe in. Well, BA, as I said, we signed this last year, which is basically we gave pretty strong commitments for 2030, which is have 70% of our electricity from renewable sources, reduce 10% our use of natural gas and replace it with electricity, reduce 75% the use of water, and of course, use as much recycled glass as you guys can give us because it's a, it's a, no, a no brainer. And of course, all of the above will offer us a lot less CO2 emissions than we have today. Well, we started to work. Actually, it was less than a year ago. I think it was July that uh, Mr. Barack Obama was here. And uh, today, actually three weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken, we uh, committed to an investment of 6 million euros on building one of the largest roof solar power plants in Europe. These will be 85,000 square meters that are enough to power, for you to have an idea, 1,700 houses and we'll save 5,000 tons of CO2 emissions per year. So it's a big thing. Of course, it's the first, but it's a clear commitment that this is one of the ways that we can help until we find other alternatives as fuel to actually lower our carbon emissions. In water, it's, uh, we already have water reusing systems. Funny enough, they're out of the 12 plants, not all of them are uh, you know, the most efficient. But what we believe as well here is by making them more efficient and investing in technology, we will be able to lower this spending of water to the levels that we ambition. Actually, we have one plant already that is below that target. So that only makes us believe that it's possible. Recycled glass, I'm not going to go into it. I think you got the message. So please, as much as you can, because we will use everything you drop in the glass bin. Finally, just to give you an update, because of course we need to measure this and every year on year try to understand if we're doing our job or not. And in the last five years alone, we already reduced 6.7% our CO2 emissions. Let me finish with two messages. Glass has been around for 5,000 years. It's not, I mean, yeah, humans existed back then, but it's quite amazing for how long it's been on. And uh, I've never heard of any problem. It's true, it's energy intensive, but I never heard of any other problem. Contamination, yeah, it breaks sometimes in your hands. Sorry, be careful. But that's the only thing. So I think this is actually one of the cases that the past can actually bring us the future. Of course, we have a lot of work to do, but I think it's the right choice in terms of packaging. The last message is, and I'm quoting Mr. Adrian Bridge from yesterday with the start of this conference, it is impossible to do this on our own. So, of course, we have a job. You as citizens have a job. You as wine stakeholders have a job. Politicians have a big job. But uh, I think all together, it will be possible to get to a more carbon-free um, uh, planet than what we have today. Thank you very much.